We are Tatsi, the Mud Hen people. The spirit of our people is of courage, of creativity, of fortitude. We have withstood the long dark times of invasion, disease, and genocide in our homeland. Now, we rebuild. We will endure. The story of my people, the Tachiyokats, is also the story of this once magnificent land in which we still live, known today as the San Joaquin River Valley. Back in a different time, many generations ago, the numbers of my people were vast, perhaps 70,000 or more of us. We lived in harmony and respect with other tribes throughout what is now known as California. We lived according to the rhythms of the earth and danced to the songs of her seasons. In our valley at that time existed the great Pu'a'chi, Tulare Lake. It was the largest body of freshwater west of the Great Lakes back east, and it helped shape who we were as a people. We used its reeds to build our homes and shelters, and boats for fishing and transportation. The Great Lake, which was twice the size of Lake Tahoe, provided abundant food for our people and habitat for the antelope, elk, and other wildlife throughout the area. Like our people, grizzly bears, wolves, coyotes, and mountain lions lived freely in their rightful habitats from the Sierra to the east to the coastal range to the west. In that time, we lived in peace and balance as hunters and gatherers, farmers and fishermen. We created hunting and cooking tools, all works of art, from the earth and its nature. This out here how it used to be just like an oasis. You say it's everything green, water, any animals, everything. Bears used to be around here, elks, and all the wild animals used to live right in the valley because this used to be rolling. And I remember that uh, when I was young before ranchers came from all over and leveled all the land. As far as you could see all, any which way, it would be uh, rolling. Our communities, our culture, and our spiritual life were strong, vital, and thriving. But all this would soon change. They, they killed the whole San Joaquin Valley Indians. And Santa Rosa, uh, Tachioca, we were on the north side of the Tulare Lake. We were the biggest tribe in California. And there was nobody left. In early years, explorers from far off lands would come to our valley and visit us in peace, exchanging goods and stories, and then they would return to where they had come from. But our valley was too beautiful and abundant for them to stay away for long. And soon, many outsiders came and wanted our valley for themselves. The Spanish came first, and they built a chain of missions along the length of California. They viewed our people as savages and heathens. They wanted to save us with their religion and enlighten us with their civilized ways. Soldiers of the missionaries used their armor, horses, and guns to force our people to move and then build their missions in haciendas. In the very, very beginning, when we heard about the new people coming to our country, uh, they, they were welcome to a certain extent. They were welcomed by our people. We figured, well, they're going to turn into Indians anyway. 
the natural course of things. You live on the land, you know, you, be, you develop the customs, you adopt the customs of the people in the area, you eventually become like the people in the area. But little did we know or did we realize that many of these people that came from all over the world, they came with their portable religion, their icons, you know, their philosophies. And they had, they had, a, they had, a, they had a different perspective and different uh, way of looking at the land than, than what we did. They outlawed and destroyed our tribal political and social institutions, centerpieces of our culture that were shaped over centuries. They also unleashed upon us the dark side of their European culture, such as technology to help them enforce their rule. Then, invisible plagues and sicknesses from their far-off lands began to attack us. Cholera, dysentery, and measles were unknown to our people, and our bodies had no natural defenses against them. By the thousands, our men, women, and children began to get sick and die. For centuries, many of our tribes migrated with the seasons to take advantage of the bounty provided by the mountains in the spring and summer and the more temperate valley in the fall and winter. This is the Santa Rosa Rancheria, but it wasn't always called the Santa Rosa Rancheria. This particular place where we're living at now was one of four principal villages that the Tachi Yokut uh, lived in. Uh, we, uh, we were a, a semi-nomadic people. We moved with the seasons, moved with the herds, and we didn't stay in one place for, uh, for permanently all year, all year round. We've had to do that in the last um, hundred years, stay right here on the Rancheria. That's because um, our migration patterns have been disrupted by the coming of many people from all over the world. In the mid-1800s, gold had been discovered in the Sierra Mountains. A new plague came upon our people and our valley. Outsiders rushed California like a swarm of locusts, wave after wave of gold diggers, farmers, settlers, and ranchers. The foreigners were hostile and racist, driving out or killing any Native American in their path. Large-scale gold digging operations in the mountains polluted our streams and rivers, killing off the native fish populations and driving our food supply far from our hunting grounds. Our people began to starve. The newly formed state government's policy of manifest destiny encouraged ranchers and farmers to claim and fence off large segments of land where once we were free to roam. Our freedom to move about our own homeland evaporated. Here, you know, our people had been flourishing on this land for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and all of a sudden, our evolution was interrupted by people that came from all over the world. They even killed off our great lake by diverting its water sources to irrigate their farms, by building dikes that decimated its wetland habitats, and by over-harvesting its dwindling supply of fish. And just as the lake began to become smaller and stagnant and dry up, so too the valley began to wither, and our people along with it. A war of extermination will continue to be waged between the two races until the Indian race becomes extinct. The newly formed California government was overly hostile to all Native American tribes. Our genocide was officially sanctioned with rewards being offered for the scalps of our men, women, and even children. They used to use dogs, the Rockweilers. If you're 12, 13 years old, uh, they'd tell the young boys to run through the sagebrush, go, and they'd turn the, loose, turn the dogs loose on them, and that's how they had their fun using Indians as 
targets for their dogs. So. With our homelands being stolen and our decimated people under violent siege, we agreed to a treaty that would move us to the perceived safety of a government-protected reservation. But as with all the other treaties we have signed with the government since then, this treaty was never ratified and honored by the government. Various Yoka tribes that used to be neighbors for centuries were split apart to live in different parts of the state. The men, women, and children of our tribe were forcibly marched on foot from our village in the San Joaquin Valley to far away in Kalinga. It was hardest on our elderly. Many of our members starved along the way. We're talking about walking from here to Kalinga. You're, you're, you're looking at 50 to 60 miles. Uh, so it, it, would be, it would be a long trek. Those of us that survived sought to begin a new life in Kalinga. But as we settled in, the invisible hands of the government uprooted us again. Oil had been discovered on our new reservation, and greedy private interests made sure that it was not going to benefit our tribe. Once more, we were forcibly marched on foot across the land, off to an even more desolate, unfertile spot 40 miles away in the Central Valley. A no man's land no white rancher or settler wanted or would claim. What was left of our people began to deteriorate on the reservation. We were a people whose culture thrived on our access to the land and nature. Here we had no resources, no food, forced to rely on corrupt government agencies that had little interest in our well-being. We were effectively prisoners. The Citizenship Act of 1924 gave all Indians American citizenship rights, while allowing us to keep our tribal citizenship. This may have sounded like a good thing at the time, yet its implementation did exactly the opposite. Back in the you know, early 1900s, you know, we were, we were in bad shape back then. Our children were sent off to government schools to be taught English. We could not practice our religion openly, and the teaching of our language and culture to our young was all but forbidden. But it wasn't until 1978 that uh, Native American ceremonial practices were actually outlawed by the U.S. government. And, uh, but it had always been maintained in uh, underground. When I was growing up, I had to go through, clear up to the sixth grade for tribal, uh, what was it, uh, tutoring. Sit there one-on-one -on -one, like me and you here, you know, they're saying, well, you know, you're going to have to learn how to talk our language and do all these other things, you know. With no resources or jobs nearby, our people lived beneath the poverty level. My grandma said, see that bed over there? Pull it and put it under that tree. That's where you're going to live. And it was just natural just for her to just say, well, get it, that's where you're going to live. And didn't have a house, but we had a bed. We were still, at the time, we were still in shacks, like a lot of the other peoples. If we had an old car, we would just fix it up to make it into a little bedroom, stay in the cars. A cold tub shower, I mean, a cold tub bath, you know, was, you know, was fine with us, you know. We would just heat our water and put it in a big tub, and and we all took turns. Everybody else, you know, the older from the the first one that jumped in the tub, there was thirteen of us in the family. So you know, you if you wanted to get clean, you had to make sure you was either second or third one in there. You know, if not, you know, then you got everybody else's dirt on you. Finally. In 1934, after living in a bureaucratic limbo for decades, the Santa Rosa Rancheria was officially established. It was 40 acres of dry, desolate farmland that no one else wanted. But we at least now had a land we could call our home. By now, there were only 40 Tachiyokuts left. Our tribe consisted of several close families 
and the village of We You became not simply a reservation, but our small, simple rancheria. We lived in tule huts, tin houses, old cars, and chicken coops. We took on American-sounding names so that we could acquire work in the area. What's your name? You know, I said, Kia. I said, oh, no, I said, no, that's not your name. Your name is Clarence Atwell Jr. I said, no, I said, I'm Kia. Who gave you that name? What? Clarence. Uh, that would come with my, uh, I guess my uh, employers who were working for my dad, I guess, or something, and then they were there, then they had to give names to everybody. Everybody else had tribal. By the 1980s, our population on the Santa Rosa Rancheria had grown to about 200 members. Despite extreme unemployment and the social ills that accompany it, we did our best at maintaining our cultural identity. By word of mouth, father to son, mother to daughter, we passed on our heritage to our new generations. We networked with other tribes and sought to practice and protect the traditions songs, skills, stories, and institutions that make us Tachi Yokuts. A long time ago when I was a kid, uh, 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 we was taught by the elders uh, um, how to sing our songs and how to do our dances. We need to keep the stories alive, um, the dancing, the singing. We've been able to, to, to stay rooted and stay grounded by by going to powwows. Her family's really into sweat lodge and prayer, so we go up there and sweat with her family. And you know, and, and those are the things that I have to make sure that my children know. They gotta keep that part of the culture. If they could keep that and, uh, and practice it and live it, then I know, you know that, I, that we as parents, my wife and I, that we did a good job because I'm sure they're gonna pass it down to their children and my grandchildren. In the early 1980s, a glimmer of hope for a better economic future dawned for the Santa Rosa Rancheria. Our tribe had opened the door to our future. It was November 4th, 1983, and we had little clue what a momentous day it would be. Well, when they first came to me, you know, I said, hey, you know, this guy's doing his nerve. That's an old ladies game. Nobody's gonna play bingo, you know, you know, all this stuff, you know. It's, oh no, no, it's, it's, you know, no, it's, it'll be high stakes. And what you talking high stakes, you know, fifty dollars, hundred dollars? Oh no. We're talking thousands. When we opened up the bingo hall and they said, Well, you know, today's the big day, you know, we're gonna open the hall for open the doors to the to the casino and so that day when we were there, I don't know what it was, but I know there was cars lined up from here all the way clear to Cleared to leave more, I guess. They were all coming in to play bingo. You know, I said, dang, that's a lot of people. You know? Just a few years later, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act was passed by Congress. It acknowledged the right of American Indians to make gaming compacts with the states where their reservations or rancherias were located. This meant more income and employment for our people. We started out with 18 machines that was just that was a tryout. I said, well, you can try this, okay? So we got the 18 machines in about a month. We made $200,000. I said, what do we do now? I said, we buy more machines. As the casino grew into a major attraction in the area, it created much needed jobs for the rancheria and provided the tribe with enough income that we could once again begin providing our community with basic necessities we could begin providing early education for our children and provide appropriate care for our elders, including a nutritious food program delivered door to door. We could build decent housing for our people and provide healing, counseling, and educational services for those that needed it. Finally, after over a century of constant hardship, our people began to see a glimmer of hope and prosperity. Growing up and seeing all the hard times uh, and then seeing the progression from when the casino was built, you know, you kind of, 
it, it keeps you grounded because you know you know what you what you've witnessed as you were growing up and then your parents and your grandparents kind of you know tell you stories from back when they were growing up out here you know it keeps you grounded it gives you a sense of, of being humble our tribal leaders uh, Clarence being one of them I mean I remember when I was small and listening to him talk and he always used to talk about we're gonna be self-sufficient and we're gonna you know this place is gonna take us in many different directions we're gonna have our own housing we're gonna have our own government we're gonna have our own this you know we're gonna have you know this is gonna you know pretty much um, provide for our, our future and everything that he said was gonna happen happened we worked with several management companies through the early years that assisted us in the growth and development of our enterprise. But in 1994, the tribe took over complete operation of the facility, and the Palace Indian Gaming Center was born. Well, it was first it was uh, British American Bingo came. They're the ones that said, well, we'll come and build your casino and all this stuff. Chief was a We've always had to ask somebody to do things. When are we ever going to say, this is what we're going to do? And he just says, he didn't have the answer. And I said, why, why do we have to ask anybody? I said, we own the thing. Everybody was there. I said, hey, you know, these guys are just coming in and, and getting their 30%. I said, we haven't gotten nothing yet. You know, what do we do, you know? So they said, well, why don't we just tell them thank you for everything they did and everything else, and then that's says, we're doing it all anyway. We might as well just go ahead and, and take it over and do it ourselves. And I said, oh, that sounds good. Today, the Tachi Palace Hotel and Casino is a thriving enterprise that has provided a true rebirth of pride and prosperity for the Santa Rosa Rancheria. Gosh, there's numerous what, what the tribe has done and also the casino has done for the community at large. I mean, it's, it's helped a lot of people strive and uh, get better along the way as a group. The average education level of our young is now high school and college level, up from an eighth grade level a mere 20 years ago. We're called the Tachiokut's early education due to the fact that we're uh, tribally owned and not considered Head Start because everybody's over income and Head Start is low income. We use a lot of the curriculum that uh, some of the schools use. We've used high reach learning. Some, when we started out, we did our own, the um, like from the crib and stuff, they had their curriculum that we had to follow. A lot of it is Basically for the three-year-olds is a lot of it is hands-on, playing, socializing, getting to share and stuff like that. Four-year-olds is more preparing, getting them ready to go into kindergarten, more of the ABCs, numbers, colors, and so forth, tracing, writing their names, and so forth. Currently, our education department um, does a lot of services for the community, from tutoring to um, monitoring the students' academics and attendance to higher education and after school program. We also run a summer enrichment program as well. We have a full staff who works with the, directly with the schools and the parents to make sure our students are um, being successful when it comes to their academics. Over 60-70% of our students are graduating from high school and moving on to higher education. So my goal is to continue that and increase those numbers so that all of our students are walking that line at high school and move on to college so that they can better themselves, educate themselves, because they are, they're the ones that are going to be our leaders in the future, and they're going to be my leaders as I get older, so I would love to see that our children are well-educated and are um, directed into that path for success. When they graduate and going to high school, walking that main line in high school is my main, That that's really heartwarming for me to see that they made it all the way, and we gave them a start. Now with our commitment to educational initiatives, scholarships and internships that help educate and train our people, we have re-established our self-sufficiency, empowering us to, among other things, grow our rancheria from only 40 acres just a few decades ago to nearly 2,000 acres of traditional lands that are still sacred to our people. Everything we have 
comes from the Mother Earth. Everything we have, we owe everything to our, our Mother Earth. In our language, we say Pa'an, the Earth. And when we go to the schools, we 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 we've been we've been we've been on we've been giving that message to school children now for the last thirty years. The Earth is also your responsibility. We Native people, we feel we're caretakers of the Earth. That's one reason why we're put here on the Earth. We're put here on the one of the reasons we're put here on the Earth is to take care of the Earth. And we tell children, you too have a responsibility to take care of the Earth. If you don't take care of the Earth, it won't take care of you. We strive to be a responsible member of our broader community and give back to our neighbors. Among other things, we've donated fire trucks to local cities in need. They've, uh, they've contributed a lot of resources and uh, support to the fire department in particular. Uh, you know, the, just the purchase of the uh, fire apparatus, uh, emergency defibrillators. They bought our uh, first generation defibrillators in the past and just the financial support that uh, Indian Gaming has done has, has made it to where we, we can survive. We've always done a lot of stuff for the community. Um, we always do the, the Relay for Life, which is for the cancer awareness. We always do the um, Toys for Tots. We, do, we donate like you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into the government system, I mean, well, the county system. That way we can run our, our uh, fire stations, our police departments. Um, a lot, of, a lot of the money is being given back to the community because the community is the ones that put us here. We have shown that, as a people, we can and will endure. Still, there is much work to be done. I, I guess we're, we're in good shape. But the young ones are going to have to use that education because the old ones are going and I don't know who's going to be watching out for the tribe. As we nurture and prepare our next generation for the challenges of our tribe's future, we must stress that it is on the foundation of our elders' experience that we must continue to grow, build, and move forward, to respect our elders and remember what they and our ancestors before them have endured. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Each day, we as a people grow stronger. We get closer to our goal of creating a community that once more lives in balance in this magnificent valley in which we live. To all my relations, <laughs>